All right, so as promised, I wanted to give you the second half of the monsters in Boost Astral Menagerie, and that's of course my review and take on these monsters, and sort of what they indicate about the future of D&D. Before we get started, I want to say that we've just put out a set of DMs resources for Spelljammer and the Light of Sarixis Adventure, which includes a revision of some of the monsters that we're going to go over today. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out on the DMs Guild. There will be a link with a special promotional discount in the description down below. But without further ado, let's get into the second half of the monsters in Boost Astral Menagerie. The first monster we're going to take a look at is the Megapede. The Megapede is a gargantuan monstrosity, it has a bite attack, it has a life drain which is an AOE around it, and it has a psychic bomb which it lobs at one creature and it does psychic damage and incapacitates that creature. Now the Megapede isn't that exciting, life drain is fine, I think it's good to have an AOE on there, I think it's fine that it can also incapacitate a creature, I like that. But I would like to see it be maybe a bit more dynamic and it's actually one of the monsters we've gone in and made a revision for in our DMs resources where we've basically made it so that it's vulnerable if attacked from below and it also gets some leg attacks it can use against creatures to try to get below it to attack it, stuff like that. Just minor revisions that makes it a bit more of a dynamic monster. All in all I think this is fairly decent monster design mostly because it has these psychic bomb and life drain features. So a decent monster I'm not hating on the Megapede. The Mercane is a merchant who trades primarily magic items of technology, blah blah blah. 12 foot tall, lanky blue giants. So these are sort of space giants. We've had quite a few giants in this uh, creature compendium and I think it's fun to get some new and perhaps more exciting giants. So they have uh, telepathy but only with their own species and regardless of the distance between them, which is something that is of course mostly role playing, but it is a fun touch in my opinion. It has a Psy Imbued Blade where it can frighten a creature when it hits with it, so I think that's fun. Putting on the Frighten condition on an attack is always, uh, yeah, just makes it a bit more dynamic. It also gets some spells and notably Dimension Door and Visibility are what it's going to use in combat basically. At CR5 I think this is fairly decent. I probably would have wanted to have maybe one more a bonus action, a reaction, some stuff like that, but as a giant and only at CR5, I think what we get here is, uh, is is pretty good. It's not bad creature design at all. And then we have a Murder Comet, which is just an incredible name and incredi incredible concept where uh, an evil spellcaster can create a Murder Comet, Comet that just flies around and well, kills stuff. So it has an insane fly speed and quite high AC, not that many hit points, and it is a CR5 creature. When it is dropped to zero hit points, it explodes and deals fire damage. And the fire damage it deals is the exact same as a fireball. So basically, it's just a fireball when it dies. It has flyby, which makes it really dangerous because it just flies around and attacks you and flies away. And it has some siege monster stuff that's not too relevant unless, of course, you're in a spell jammer ship when the murder comet attacks you. And that makes it a bit fun. Where the monster is less exciting is on its attack end because it just has the slam attack and it's not a very damaging slam attack and then it can spit some fire. Once again I probably would have wanted it to have maybe a bit more but it is still kind of a fun creature in combat because it has that flyby feature so you're gonna have to nail it down somehow, you're gonna have to really take uh, prepared actions to get ready to hit it when it comes close, stuff like that. And that does make it more dynamic in combat. Even so, some actions that could do a bit more than just Spitfire or Slam would have been appreciated, I think. The Nithalku, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, are born in a nightmarish far realm and they are basically aberrations that look kinda like spiders. So it's a CR4 creatures with uh, quite high hit points but low AC and it can eat brains and basically uh, learn the languages of the brains that it has eaten. It has a bite attack, a claw attack, and it can extract a brain. And that's pretty much like the brain devourer, mind devourer, whatever it's called, the small illithid creature that eats brains. Um, except that this one is a far less complicated. It should be noted that it can only do so on an incapacitated humanoid. So it can also use a mind blast, with it, which is a watered down version of the illithid's mind blast where it only leaves the target incapacitated, but of course becoming incapacitated against the Nethalku is pretty dangerous because then you're subject to the extract brain feature. The Nethalku also gets spells and we have uh, quite a few notable spells here. 
which depends on how many brains it has eaten, which is quite fun. So it can cast Arm of Adar, that's pretty usable, Magic Missile can come in use, Darkness is fine, Whole Person, Invisibility, Fear, Hypnotic Pattern, Stinking Cloud. There's a lot of stuff it can do depending on how many brains it has eaten. And I think that's a really fun feature. I think the Nethalgo is a really fun creature all in all. I think it has some uh, quite fun abilities and I love that it gets spells based on the amount of brains it has eaten. That's a really fun, nice touch. Then we have Neogis. I believe that we've seen Neogis before. Um, and the Neogi is not the most powerful creature at CR 3. Uh, but it's basically a hatchling swarm we're looking at here. And it can swarm, so that's the ordinary swarm stuff. And it bites, which can poison a creature. At CR 3, you maybe would have wanted it to do a bit more. Um, but it's not, again, horrible. I think it's a fine creature. Neogi Pirate gets Mental Fortitude, and it gets a Bite Attack that once again poisons, and a Claw Attack, not the most exciting creature, still CR3, so we can forgive it, maybe for only being able to use the Poison Condition, but I think once again that it could have been given a bit more to do. Now we get the Void Hunter at CR4, and this one has a lot more to do, it has Devil's Side, it has the same Mental Fortitude and Spider Climb, it also has that Bite Attack, and then it can also shoot Eldritch Bolts, and it can use Dimension Door and Invisibility, and on a bonus action it can enslave a creature, which basically makes them charmed, and it obeys the Neogis command. So this is really fun monster design, I love this creature. It has, a, it has good viable melee attack actions, it has a good viable range attack action, and it has some spells that are actually usable, and it has a very, very cool bonus action. You really only get to use that bonus action once, but it is a really cool one that will dominate a creature. So yeah, a lot to do here. I would have loved for it to be able to create darkness somehow, so it can sort of interact with its devil side. That would have been a nice touch, I think. Plasmoids are also a playable race in the book, and basically the plasmoid is a Morpheus, it can hold its breath, and it has a pseudopod that deals burning damage, and it has uncanny dodge, so not the most interesting creature. Um, basically a big blobbery bag of hit points with an AC of 11 and 82 hit points at CR4. Yeah, that's not so exciting. And this is actually the boss creature, so this would be the most exciting kind of plasmoid. Nah, not too enthused about uh, the plasmoid boss at all. Plasmoid Explorer, much of the same, but even less fun because it doesn't even get uncanny dodge, it just has have attacks and at Morpheus form, so that's really uh, uninteresting. And I think I think it's it's continually disappointing how the sort of humanoid like creatures really don't get a lot to do in 5e, and I would have wanted them to give this plasmoid explorer something that made it a bit more unique than just being a Morpheus because that's not gonna come into play very often. Plasmoid Warrior, same deal, except that it has a pistol as well. Once again, not very exciting. Not seeing exactly how this is gonna be very fun to fight against, basically. Then we have a Surlon. This is a medium aberration, with a challenge rating of 2, it has a biting claw text, it has psychic crush that deals psychic damage, and it has some spell casting which includes disguise self and suggestion. So this is a sort of infiltrator kind of creature, and that's fun. I like that it has something, a psychic crust that targets a saving throw instead of just being attacked, but I would have wanted it to maybe incapacitate creatures, stuff like that, and that's actually something we've done for the Sherlong Ringer, which is down here, which is included in our vision of the monsters in the adventure. So the Sherlong itself, not terribly exciting. Suggestion is fun though, suggestion is fun. Surlon Leader, a bit more here, it has two heads, so it gets some uh, condition advantages. It can make a bite attack, claw attack, and then it has Pacify, which can put a creature unconscious. That's really fun. It has Psychic Crush again, and it also gets Mage Armor, Dimension Door, Suggestion, and Disguise Self. Dimension Door is really useful, Suggestion still very fun. So yeah, I think the thing that's fine, you have all this multi-attack stuff where you can both do two bite attacks, two claw attacks, and use Pacify or Psychic Crush, so it actually does a lot on its turn. What I don't particularly like about that is that if it wants to cast a spell, it does so at an action. So it ha basically has to weigh, am I going to use Suggestion or am I going to use all of these other things I can do? Um, so maybe Psychic Crush or Pacify should have been a bonus action instead, so it doesn't compete that much with the, with its spell casting. But yeah, quite fun creature this one. The Surlong Ringer is much like the ordinary Surlong. It uh, has basically the same stuff. It's just less powerful and um, doesn't get the disguise self stuff. 
So that's one of the creatures we've actually updated in our uh, enhanced monsters in the DM's resources for Light of Abrixis. And looking at the first Riker here, we see that it has a Telerith. The Telerith is described up here. It deals an extra, it deals extra force damage and it can summon a golem that looks just like itself. And so basically it summons a copy of itself, sort of like a simulacrum. Um, so it can basically copy itself in combat, that's pretty fun. And it has glory, which means it includes charisma. Not necessarily required to say that, but sure, it makes sense why it has so high uh, AC. For the trident attack, we're told that it deals extra force damage, of course, if it has its telerith, and it can also shoot a chromatic bolt, which can deal different types of damage. So I think that's pretty fun, uh, that you get to change the type of damage. It has some spells. Mass suggestion is, of course, awesome. Phantasmal force can be useful. Dimension door. Uh, all of these spells are useful, so it gives it some versatility, and then it can do that summon golem action. So the Rhaegar at Chandra Ring 8, probably not overwhelmingly powerful, I'd say, because all of this competes with each other, so basically it can deal maybe 20 damage uh, or 22 damage with the Chromatic Bolt, or it can cast one of these spells, Master Jason, of course, being a standout, that's going to be a good action to take, uh, or summon this golem. Because the Rhaegar can summon a copy of itself, which has the same spell list and stuff like that, uh, just without the the Telerith, then um, then you actually get a creature that's worthy of that Challenge Ring 8, because you're going to assume that, that that's the first thing it's going to do, and then you have two Rhaegars casting all of these fun spells. So yeah, uh, pretty interesting creature. I, I like this design, actually, uh, when you consider that it does copy itself. Further on, we have the Scavers, which are these sort of floating sharks. And uh, there's a bunch of these scavers. We've done revisions of the brown scaver, gray scaver, and void scaver because these feature in the adventure. And um, we can basically go over these all in one because the scavers are quite similar. They, all of them get a bite attack. The larger ones have a swallowing bite attack. And then the void scaver, the most powerful, the challenge rating 11, gets that ray of fear bonus action, which I think is nice. But beyond that, it's just a bite attack that can perhaps swallow a creature. Now my issue with design like this is that if we look at the brown scaver at Chandrine 4, it's going to deal 11 damage. It then has to swallow you, so it means you have to fail the same throw before it actually deals a bit more damage. So it's quite weak, especially against characters that will succeed on that dexterity saving throw. And for the void scaver, its spite deals a lot of damage, so if you're hit by that, that's going to hurt. If it misses that attack, and if you don't get swallowed, then once again, the Void Scaver is not doing a whole lot on this turn, so what we did for the Scavers was give them some additional features, sort of uh, more eye rays even for the lesser Scavers, so they had some more stuff to do on that turn, and then um, also reducing the Swallowing by damage a bit to sort of make up for getting some more versatile actions. All in all, I'm not impressed with the Void Scavers. I hate that many monsters and beasts we get, or monstrosities and beasts we get in 5e are not that exciting or versatile in combat. Next up we have the solar dragons. I love me some dragons so that'll be fun and we'll start by taking a look at the ancient solar dragon which is a 1021 creature with 425 hit points and 18 AC. It can do flyby attacks, it has legendary resistance, it can't uh, be, its mind can't be read, it has siege monster feature and then it has the spider attack, tail attack as we're used to and it does a phototonic breath that is a constitution saving throw that deals radiant damage but nothing else and it has light legendary actions which are tail attack and blinding brilliance which can blind creatures so legendary actions quite underwhelming i would have loved to see it get something else uh, for this protonic bread so maybe uh, another effect here restraining if it's something that blossoms up on the ground something like that anything really that can sort of interact with the battlefield beyond just dealing damage because aside from that it only has this blinding brilliance uh, brilliance and that doesn't even deal damage so it's not that effective. Uh, some spell casting would have been nice as well. And maybe another legendary action that uh, could also make it a bit more impressive in combat. All told, it's not the worst, worst dragon we get by any means, but it's also not the most fun and dynamic dragon I've seen, especially not when you compare it with the dragons we recently got in fist bands. So um, I think, once again, the dragon here is a bit underwhelming. We also have an adult, adult solar dragon, there's not much difference here. The young solar dragon has even less to do because there's no legendary actions. And then we have the solar dragon wormling, which of course has even less to do. And that's where these become sort of not very interesting at all. 
Then there are space clowns, which are inhabitants of the wild space system known as clown space. So that's uh, an interesting concept. And it's a fiend with a chance rating of 2 that bursts with acid damage when it dies. It has shoes that squeaks, so it basically can't still love on you. It has a shock attack and it has a ray gun that if it hits a creature with an intelligence score of 3 or higher, uh, becomes incapacitated. So that's really fun. You shoot him with sort of a laughing gun, basically. Uh, I think that's a very, very nice touch and has some spellcasting, which includes mirror image, which is nice. Spider climb can come in handy and friends may change precision, probably not going to be used in combat. And then it also has this bonus action you can use three times per day and it can basically assume a phantasmal form. So that's more like a disguise self then we have a space eel, which is a small beast, chance rating one half, so we don't expect much from it. It can attach itself and deal peeling, piecing damage on its turn. It also has a tail spine that can paralyze creatures. So this is fun design, I think this is fun beast design at one and a half CR. We don't want it to do too much, we don't want it to be uh, overly complicated at all, because you may run into a dozen of these at the same time, but just giving it that opportunity to poison or paralyze creatures and also attached to creatures with this bind attack. I think that's really, really fun. And um, so yeah, I like the space eel. That's good low CR monster design in my opinion. The space gobby is, uh, yeah, it's just a fish. I don't think we need to talk too much about a CR zero creature. This is not a combat creature they're gonna run into. Then we have space hamsters and this is, <sighs> I think this is disappointing because you know the giant hamster is a funny thing, it's boost uh, hamster, stuff like that. So it's really iconic and sort of should be an interesting fun creature. And just giving it a step block that has a bite attack and hit points and AC is such a wasted opportunity. I don't know what the space hamster is supposed to be able to do, but I would want it to do something beyond this. It's sort of like the owl bear, which is also in my opinion quite iconic, but it doesn't do anything beyond biting and clawing. Um, so yeah, not impressed by the giant space hamster, which is a shame again, because it's a fun concept. We also have a regular space hamster, which is same CR, it has a, a bite attack as well, and it has go for the eyes, which is exactly what I wanted on the giant space hamster as well. And a bonus action you could take to take the dash or disengage action. So why not just take some of these features and also put them up here to make that step up also interesting because the regular tiny space hamster is actually a much more fun creature. Um, so yeah, again, a bit of a wasted opportunity in my opinion. Then we have the space mollymog, which is just a space seagull. Flyby, hold breath, bite attack once again. Not interesting, challenge range zero. So <sighs> did we really need the space mollymog if we could have just had like uh, or in a raven, it's basically the same creature. Um, maybe it doesn't have flyby, but who cares about flyby when you deal four damage? I don't know. Uh, again, not very impressive. Space swine, another thing where we get a flying pick that only has a bite attack. So, what's the point? We could use a griffin stat block or whatever you have at CR one fourth. Um, we didn't need to invent a new space wine if it's not going to do anything else. Uh, I think that in previous books you would have just written uh, the Drovas ride on space swine, use the giant eagle stat block or whatever you have. So yeah, not, not an interesting creature at all. And it's a shame because you really need interesting beasts beast at lower CR to challenge low CR parties. Then we have a Suran Defiler. So these are lizard folk who live in space. It's a monstrosity lizard folk. Hold its breath, its AC includes its intelligence. And it's CR3. It has claw, it has defile that deals necrotic damage, and it also gives the uh, Suran Defiler hit points, and it can also cast Mage Hand Invisibility. So this is decent. I think that the Defile action uh, really compensates for its otherwise lack of impressiveness, and casting Invisibility is of course gonna come in handy. Once again, it's something that could use a bit extra to do, but I'm happy enough with what we get here. I think it's fine to have a, a CR3 creature with the, with these actions. So um, so yeah, not bad. And I really love the art over here. That's a very, very cool art. Then we have a Suran Poisoner, which has a claw and javelin attack, and then can throw a poison bomb, which 
poison creature. No, it just deals poison damage. So that to me is uh, not very fun. Uh, I would have wanted to poison people. Then it would have been a lot more fun because it can affect the battlefield once more. Now it's just an AOE uh, attack that deals 10 damage. So not too interesting. Then we get to the Starlight Apparition, which is a medium celestial at challenge rating 5. It has astral existence, illumination, incorporate movement, and unusual nature, so it's basically a ghost. And it can make a ra radiant eruption attack at medium range that blinds creatures, which is nice, I like that. And it can also do possession just like a ghost. So, it's, so it is basically just a space ghost, but the radiant eruption feature is quite fun. Could it use a bit more to do? I think so at challenge rating 5, but uh, but yeah, I'm not going to hate on the Starlight Apparition. It's fine for what it is. It's mostly going to be about using that possession feature more than anything else, which makes it less important whatever else this ghost has in its step block. Then we have Trikeens, which are these four-armed insectile monstrosities that we can also use as player character races and they can attack with their weapons that deal damage and they have a leap and they can parry. So at January 7 this is still just gonna be a upfront martial combat like creature not necessarily something that's gonna be hugely interesting to fight against but I do appreciate that it has both a bonus action and a reaction. I just think that if this was a January 3 creature with these bonus action reactions I would have been really happy with it. But at Challenge Ring 7, you probably wanted to do a bit more than just dealing damage and parrying. Thrakin Honda, much of the same, except that it has a Chameleon Carapace, which you can use to make stealth checks. And Challenge Ring 2, this is uh, the kind of creature design I would expect and I like. It has attacks, it has some cool bonus action, it can actually choose between two, and then it has this parry, so it becomes a kind of dynamic uh, opponent in combat. And I, and I like that. The Thrakin Mystic has attacks, it has Drain Vitality, where it deals necrotic damage, and then it regains hit points, equal to what's dealt. It has some spell casting, which includes Invisibility, Freedom Movement, and Levitate, so that's some fun spells. And then it has the Chameleon Carapace, so I think the Trikin Mystic is actually also pretty fun. Then we get to the Vampirates, which are Vampire Pirates in space. They really uh, went out of the way to make an original name for those, yeah. Uh, Chant Ring 2, it, can, it explodes when it dies, it has an energy drain feature where it creates a shadow if the creature dies, and a light crossbow. So my issue with this is that this creature only becomes different from any other creature with an attack uh, once it dies, or it kills uh, another creature. So if it doesn't do either of those things, or until it does either of those things, it's just going to be hitting and getting hit, basically. Um, I would have wanted it, this attack to maybe do something else. It's also one of the creatures we have uh, done some work on in our revised monsters in the DM's resources where we've given it, given it a bit more to do, some bonus actions that makes it a lot more, in my opinion, dynamic. You will also note that a Chandrine 2 dealing 11 damage per turn is really, really low. Um, so that actually makes the Vampire quite underpowered for its CR, I would say, because its damage output is just so, so small. Moving on, the Vampire Captain is a stronger version. It has Explode, it has Energy Drain, it has Heavy Crossbone, has this ship invisibility action, which can make a ship uh, invisible, but when it's not on a ship, that's not really gonna matter. And then it gets Uncanny Dodge. Once again, not very impressed with it because it's still dealing very low damage for CR6. And of course, ship invisibility has a function in the adventure and is, is a feature that can be fun, but it's also not something that's going to make it better in combat, so energy drain doesn't really help it. Um, so what we've also done for this is just give it more bonus actions, give it some more versatility and dynamic stuff to do in combat. Then there is the Vampire Mage. I like this one better because it still doesn't do too much damage with its energy drain, but it can also shoot rays of cold. You'll notice it's the same damage, so it's really what you're going to use, probably what you can reach people with. But it also gets Darkness, Fly, Hypnotic Pattern, Dimension Door, which are really usable spells in combat. So I think that sort of makes up for not having so much else to do. Spellcasters are generally just more dynamic in combat. Lastly, we have the Soda, which is a medium aberration. The voice stuff is not too interesting, has legendary resistance, and it can make a multi-attack, and it can force another creature to teleport, dealing force damage, and then teleport it to another space of the Soda's choice. This is a very fun feature, I love this feature. 
and it then can also use Wish, which is also really fun. It's not the most interesting creature, I think, because uh, beyond Force Teleport, which is really, uh, well, the most fun feature it has, it's just hitting with its fist. But because it has that crushing fist feature, or that Force Teleport feature, it is going to move the characters around in the battlefield, creating for some fun scenarios, I think. And the Wish build basically gives the DM carte blanche to do virtually anything. This soda could basically maybe summon a creature or something, open a gate, I don't know. Um, it does say that the soda is destroyed after using Wish, so that sort of limits the stuff it can do, but it can do some really crazy stuff with a Wish build. So yeah, that's my thoughts on the second half of the Monsters in Spelljammer, Adventures in Space and Boost Astral Menagerie. And I think that there are some standouts that are good, and I think there are some places where I would have really seen them be a bit more ambitious with the monster design. Um, overall, I'm pretty happy with the amount of monsters we get, and I think that there are some of them that are quite interesting and fun additions. I would probably expect more. I think that we have had previous publications such as Fistbanes, such as Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica that really introduces more dynamic and interesting monsters. So to not get those in the newest book for 5e is a bit disappointing. Anyway, if you agree or disagree with anything I've said, please let me know in the comments down below. And while you're down there, you can also like and subscribe. That really helps out a lot. And if you want to support the channel and what we do here, head on over to patreon.com slash and become a patron to get access to a lot of awesome 5e D&D content as well as get your input on what kind of videos we make and all that kind of stuff. Beyond that, there's not a whole lot left to say except thank you so much for watching and I hope that I'll see you in the next video.